what they're trying to do. They're trying to hit the end of the line and roll it on up. It's, it's a flank attack. The Union Army could never apparently guard its flanks. Never could. Look at it. I, I don't know. They never seem to learn that lesson. Uh, multiple battles. Uh, so McClaws is sitting over there at that observation tower behind me, and he's like, well, that's nice. I can go up this tower. And, uh, <laughs> ooh, that's nice. You got to come up, Bob. Uh, um, he's over there, and he can't execute his orders. And he sends back word, and he says, I can't execute my orders. Longstreet is already perturbed because it's now around, you know, two, almost 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they're not even in position. This attack should have started like two or three hours earlier. And now they're just, they're, there's nobody. They're not in position. Longstreet's in a bad mood. McClaw's in a bad mood. It, it's all going to, and Longstreet tells him, attack. The orders are, you need to push the attack. And McClaw says, all right, well, he's getting ready to go. And James Longstreet personally, physically arrives upon the field and calls the attack off until Hood can get into position over here. All right, so I'm working my way down to, to the program today. That Confederate attack line, once it gets into position, will basically stretch down, for you, for you modern visitors, will basically stretch down all the way to the, to the park's present-day oh. picnic area and a little bit past that. And Longstreet will have his brigades. I will give him uh, credit for this. He does not have a single brigade front. He has a double brigade front. In other words, he has four brigades in each division. He has eight brigades on this field out here. And he's going to attack, and uh, he will have one brigade to back up the other. So that attack is going to begin on the south end of the battlefield. And it's going to come uh, stepping off with the Alabamians, followed by the Texans and the Arkansas people. And, you know, it rolls down through here until they eventually get to Kershaw. Am I back to that word again? Kershaw? 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 I don't know. Right out here. Uh, that eventually gets to their position. And uh, can't find them when I need them. They're going to come out here, right here. They eventually get to the South Carolinians. <laughs> all right. Oh, all right. It's set up right there. Okay. All right. Thanks. So <laughs> I thought that would go over better. <laughs> A big chance. Right here. And the reason I can't, I'm not, I can't pivot this crowd on on a dime out here. But uh, the South Carolinians are going to uh, start their attack from over here, and they're going to be coming basically where the rose farm is behind the peach orchard. Well, what did I tell you? The attack is supposed to be jumping off from the right to the left in echelon. Right to left, right to left. So they're like a row of falling dominoes as the brigades go in. Well, they get to Kershaw, he punches it on in. He comes across this road, the Emmitsburg Highway right here. He gets over the rose farm and he looks over to his left and uh, there's nobody there. <coughs> it's uncovered. And so Kershaw is going to split his brigade and the right half is going to go forward kind of toward the wheat field, some place called we don't, we don't say too much anymore, the Stony Hill in that general vicinity. And his left flank is going to wheel to come up and attack toward the peach orchard. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting down to the basic program today, you have got Union forces not only facing this way, You've also got a couple of regiments, I'll name in a second, facing this way. So you actually have it surrounding the peach <coughs> orchard at right angles. And the point is, getting down to the peach orchard, that they shoot those South Carolinians to pieces out there. Some of the, some of the uh, Union gunners were talking about the canteens on the South Carolinians shining in the sunlight, and they focused in on them when they were blasting them. You know, they just shoot for those shiny objects which basically made their, their sh lowered their shots, you know, because they're on the, they're trying to get them to fire low. Kershaw is getting beaten to death.
need a 50cc engine with a big muffler. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is, right there. Uh, Brother Jeff, you want to so, why is that next Confederate Brigade not covering Kershaw? He's getting killed out here. He's getting killed out here in this field. I mean, his troops are being slaughtered. In fact, the majority of them will have to fall back because of the of, the, of what's happening out there. And that, that, that's another walk within itself. But what's happening over here on this front? This is where I'm getting down to Barksdale. The next Confederate Brigade in line is going to be under the command of William Barksdale from Mississippi. Now, where in the heck is William Barksdale right now? Well, he hasn't gone forward. And he is right in that tree line, basically behind that house over there. And around where the Mississippi Monument is today. Go shucks at that. How about that? He formed up near the Mississippi Monument. Where all these things? How did they know where to go? So befitting. Right there. Barksdale is agitated. He's very agitated. And as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, he wore coattails <laughs> to the Battle of Gettysburg. If you want to be in fine style, you want to wear coattails all the way out right here. Uh, Barksdale is actually from Tennessee before the war. Uh, he settles in Columbus, Mississippi. Uh, he was a Mason, if I forget to tell you that at the end of the tour, that's a good point to point out, if I forget to tell you that story, but he was a, a, a Mason. And more importantly, he was a former member of the U.S. House of Representatives. And he is the guy in the aftermath, I don't know how well this is going to show up, but it's a great story anyway. In the, in the, House, of Represent the House of Representatives today is, is utter chaos. But the thing that I comfort myself with is that it's always been chaos. <laughs> the House has always been chaos, and the Senate is where it all is supposed to cool down. You know, that's how the government, the founding fathers, set it up right here. Well, my point is, and before the war, these northern and southern representatives would get in the fisticuffs on the floor because that's where the business of the nation used to be, uh, you know, done. Instead of, you know, just showing up for a vote, you stayed in there all day long and you'd have different sides of the aisle and everything anyway there's two different versions of the story but basically what happens is that barksdale gets into a fight with one of the northern representatives and uh i think it was elihu washburn how about that if you don't if you're impressed by that name you ought to meet his brother named cadwallader <laughs> right there but anyway they got these two washburn guys in there in this version of the story and Barksdale, which was a big man, he was over six foot tall, he weighed like 240 pounds, he's a big broad guy. He gets in a fight, and as he's fighting with this guy, the northern representative reaches up, I hope this doesn't happen, the northern representative reaches up and grabs Barksdale by the hair. And when he grabs his hair, his hair comes off. <laughs> Which apparently, as you look at it, so now be honest with you, you didn't even know, did you? Did you? Huh? Uh huh. See? Right there. Uh huh. So they reach up, they get that hair right there, and he holds it up, and when he grabs his hair, everybody stops fighting. <laughs> and they start laughing. And the, I believe it was Washburn, gets up in the speakers. Um, or up on the rostrum, and he holds up Barksdale's toupee, and he says to the other representatives who were falling out laughing now, he says, look, boys, I've scalped it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I thought it was a very good story. Nobody thought it was good. But that's one of the more famous, infamous stories from the pre-war days. Barksdale is a fire eater. Anybody know? Everybody know what a fire eater is? I don't mean he's with the carnival. <laughs> okay? He, he is a secession man. He is a sec secessionist. And um, he advocates for that over and over and over again. And basically what happened is, I don't know if you'll ever hear this refrain again. I hope not. But basically they were saying, if you don't give us our way, then we're leaving. And that keeps happening. If this happens or if this happens, then we're just going to 
we're just going to go ahead and create our, our own nation. And in December of 1860, and specifically in January of 1861, uh, South Carolina and Mississippi are going to go out of the Union. And here's a small world, clash of things right here. And uh, Barksdale is going to be part of that. Now, I can't tell you, one of my pet peeves, which I've done this, so I ought to be mad at myself about this, is that people that I'm always was, I don't do this stuff anymore, always the guy in the corner running his mouth. <laughs> you know, that, you're, that the, your bigger friends have to bail out, right? So that's what I picture fire eaters as. They do all this talk, but when the shooting starts, where are they? They're not around, are they? Barksdale is. I'll give him credit for that. He enters the Confederate service uh, as a regimental commander, and he rises up through the ranks until uh, he is in the brigade command right here. Uh, from left to right, he has in his line over there the 18th Mississippi. I got the numbers written down. The 13th Mississippi, the 17th, and the 21st. Now, going back, his men are laying down. If we were here on July 2nd, they were laying down. They were laying down right there. How about the made like the Red Sea? That was pretty funny. Uh, you know, I, I had a guy tell me one time, worked for the NRA, that if you got, if you gave a lot of money and you got the behind-the-scenes tour, that when you got to Charleston Heston's office, like the grand finale, is you got to hold the staff. <laughs> <laughs> I know everything you could hold in that NRA museum. How about them apples right there? <laughs> the staff. <laughs> yeah. You know, like... So anyway, Barksdale and his Mississippians are over there, and they're laying down. Why are they laying down? Not a trick question. They don't want to be seen because what's happening? Artillery's going back and forth, and you want to hide your troops. Now, I don't know the distance. But what you need to know, I would say, what is that, four or five hundred yards longer? I don't know. Depends on where you're going, I guess. Uh, maybe five, six hundred. Um, this spot where we're standing right now, ladies and gentlemen, is not the place you want to be on July 2nd. It's not. The Confederates have deployed artillery all the way down. You people that got on my right over here can have a better shot of it. But you look, follow that tree line over there all the way down, that's as far as the Confederate artillery goes. And what are they doing? The Confederates are not only shooting straight, but what artillery wants to do, ideally, is oblique or enfilade, okay? And so what are they doing? You've got Confederate shells coming from that direction and that direction. So here at the Peach Orchard, and especially for these Union artillery batteries on the obverse side, the Union side of this hill, you would have cannonballs coming over the hill and skipping over the hilltop into your battery and you're at right angles to them. I don't know how many times the shot uh, lined up perfectly for you, but it knocked down, it could knock down potentially a lot of people, a lot of guns if it hit right. Of course, then again, the Confederates can't see it. So they don't know how lucky a shots they're getting over there for the most part, but they're in a crossfire and Union infantry in this general vicinity would be down here hugging the ground. If I was them, I'd probably put them a little bit more on the slope, but you know, you gotta try to hold what you can. And these troops that are facing this way, you know, as they're facing Kershaw and everything, they're still getting hammered by the Confederate ar artillery over here. It's not a place I would want to be. A very tight situation, to say the least. And uh, going back to the original point, which I've had many people that watch the video, they say, I like to watch you because eventually you'll get back to where you were supposed to be. <laughs> now, you may have to go around the barn to get there. All right? You got that? <laughs> Barksdale is sitting over there, and Kershaw is getting slaughtered out here. What does the battlefield of Gettysburg teach you? You know, people come here and they're like, okay, so what else can we learn about the Battle of Gettysburg? 
what else can be taught from the Battle of Gettysburg? You know, there is nothing like coming out on this field. Hey, Bob, what's going on? Uh, what the battlefield teaches you, if you will let it teach you, is you can read a thousand books on the Battle of Gettysburg. But until you stand over there with James Longstreet and William Barksdale, you will never understand that James Longstreet could not see what was happening to the South Carolinians over here. We like to look at it from an aerial standpoint on a map. That's not what was happening on July 2nd of 1863. They are, they are looking over here, and they, they are not magicians. They can't see over the hill. And so what does that mean? What I think Longstreet is doing is he doesn't mean the South Carolinians to get caved in or slaughtered out there. What he's trying to do is allow the Confederates to develop the end of the Union line and start pushing it in. So he's trying to slow down the momentum. So Barksdale, going back to him, he comes up to Longstreet and he goes, General, let me go in. I can take that battery in five minutes. It's firing over here at the Sherpy house, all up and down the highway right here. And Longstreet turns to him and he says, be patient, we'll all be going in in just a little while. Barksdale comes back to him, I don't know how many minutes elapsed, and he renewed his plea to allow him to go forward. And Longstreet demurs again until eventually, only a few seconds after that, a couple of minutes after that, he turns to his staff officer and he says, go, go get him, something along those lines. And this moment right here was um, captured. It was a Georgian, I told you earlier that those um, Confederate brigades and Longstreet's attack was back to back. You know, they have one in front and they have one behind. Well, behind Barksdale back here was Wofford's Georgians. So Barksdale physically is between the Georgians and the Mississippians in the rear, somewhere in there, right back behind that tree line in that area. And the Georgian recorded this. There was a field just in, the, in advance of us, and Barksdale's Mississippians were in the edge of the woods some 40 paces to our front. It's really tight, so what does that tell you? They're probably trying to get both brigades up in the woods. Why? Because they're wearing what? I mean, look at what you're wearing. Look how hot you are. Right here, no? Nobody, okay. Uh, <laughs> I got leave of my captain to go forward to the edge of the field and reconnoiter, promising to return at once if the line was formed. When I reached the edge of the wood, Barksdale's men had formed line in the edge of the field preparing to charge. General Barksdale came back to near where I stood, hidden by the undergrowth, and stepping behind a large white oak tree, uncovered his head and with his right hand and face lifted up, began his silent prayer. I could see his lips move, but I heard no sound. Before his devotions were ended, a courier came with an order. One of his aides went to him and touched him and gave him the message. This guy's watching this. All transpire, of course, you know, he's seeing a moment in history he replaced his cap, walked rapidly to his horse, mounted, and gave the order. yourself in the shoes of that man over there. He's kneeling down. He's got to know what's coming. Now you think about these soldiers. You think about these Union soldiers sitting here in this, laying here in this peach orchard. 
they said that some of these men, I'm getting ahead of the story, they said some of those Yankees, when they made them stand up over the Chirpy Farm, some of them stood up and they were shaking. Just literally shaking when they stood up. Why? Because they had shells exploding all around them for the last hour or so. That's not a very comforting feeling, you know? And they're standing up. And both sides, you got these Confederate soldiers over there in that wood line. And I can tell you right now, it's 888 miles all the way to Houston, Mississippi. <laughs> get it for Pennsylvania. All right. And uh, that's a long way from home. And uh, I mean, what's going through their mind right now? Since we're concentrating on Barksdale, let's do it. You're sitting over there. What have you seen? What have you seen so far? I mean, what is galvanizing you right now? Do you think you wake up in the morning and you're really excited to get killed? You know, it just doesn't work that way, does it? It doesn't work that way. These Mississippians are standing over there, and I'm sure most of the majority of the thoughts were about their family and their loved ones. But what have they seen? What did they see down in Virginia? What have they seen with this Union Army? What are they hearing about Vicksburg right now? You know, I think about this sometimes in the modern era. I mean, they have to have heard that people inside of Vicksburg are being shelled. The civilians are being shelled by the United States Army inside that city right there. They were at Fredericksburg, which is a little off note. I don't know why this got swept under the rug either, but that Union Army just ransacked the whole town. Run around in dresses. Crazy <laughs> stuff. You know? And they, they were in the streets fighting with them. You got men, the paradox of this whole thing is that places like Warren County, which is where Vicksburg, Mississippi is, was an old Whig County. I'm getting deep with y'all in politics right now. It's an old Whig County. But of all the counties in Mississippi, there were two. That and the one below it, Natchez, Mississippi, Adams County, that voted against secession. Two counties voted against it. Old Whig County, <coughs> Unionist County, River Towns. You think they're dumb? Where are they getting their money from? From the river. War's not good for business, all right? They're sitting over here, and a lot of those men are from those two counties. They're in those ranks. What happened to them? When the war kicks off, there are no neutral people. You don't think the majority of the northern people and the majority of the southern people really wanted to stay out of this thing? They did. They really wanted to. Most people, like today, are moderates. And they didn't want any part of Barksdale and this fire-eating stuff, and they didn't want any part of the other side either. And now they're stuck in it. Now, you put yourself in the shoes right there. All that emotion's going on, and you've been having cannonballs crash over the top of you, and you got a good idea of what's coming. Because you've been through it before. And you're slaying there. And the first thing that happens is here comes Barksdale. Now there's two different versions. Either he's wearing, riding a white horse, can't beat that, or he's riding a black horse, <laughs> can't beat that. It was probably, depending on who, how you like your Western movies, but uh, he comes riding behind the brigade first. And when he rides behind, he's telling us, he passes every colonel. He has four colonels commanding those regiments. He's telling everyone, it's time. It's time. The colonels start telling the captain, get them ready. We're going in shortly. And the men start, they know. They see the couriers bustling around. They've been in combat before. They know what's coming now. Barksdale gets to the end of his line. If you were here, take a look at it. Take your eyes off me. You can stare at me all day. There it is right there. If you were standing here on July 2nd of 1863, and you were looking across that field, you would have seen him. Barksdale gets to the end of his line. He wheels that horse around. And as those men stand up off out of that wood line right there, he starts dashing down the line. He's got his hat off, you know, and he's dashing down the line. And if you're going to get men to die, you better get them excited about it. <laughs> and he's coming down because he's ready. I'm not saying he's ready to die, but he's ready to do it. And he's going to take this Union position. It's like a like any sporting event, anything else. It's time to 
to get pumped up. And no better troops of any, any, any salt would ever unfurl their flags before it was absolutely necessary in the middle of an artillery bombard. Why would they not do that? <laughs> they target all the flags. There are no flags flying. As they come down, look folks, I'm talking to them blue. You can imagine a lot better than I can. Barksdale comes down through here, and those first thing up would be the color guard. They would stand up, they would shake those battle flags out, and the men would start standing up. And I don't know who started what here, but they start they start that slow yip. That old rebel yell right there, it'd start yipping at them and it would start growing. Check it out on YouTube. There's actually some 1920s recordings of old Confederate veterans doing it right there. Those old Missis those Mississippi boys would stand up over there and they had a lot to settle with these men over here. And they would start yelling slowly, slowly until it built into a crescendo. And mixed in the midst of all this would be some big smack talking going on. Like, what we're, we are telling you what we're about to do, and we're about to do it, and there's nothing you can do about it. You ever had that with your sports team? I saw that in the Egg Bowl this past November against Mississippi State. We went five wide, and I was like, well, all these Mississippi State folks standing around me, they felt quite confident, apparently. To me, I said, how many cornerbacks y'all got? <laughs> zip, 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 touchdown, right there. A feeling of elation overcame your rangers <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> Woo! Pull that train whistle on. <laughs> Coming through. Those Mississippians form along that tree line. Barksdale dashes down the line. He pulls up in front of his old regiment, the 13th Mississippi. He pulls up in front of that and um, pulls his horse there. He had told his, his colonels earlier that... Uh, uh, quote, the line before you must be broken, he said. To do so, let every officer and man animate his comrades by his personal presence in the front line. All officers will be dismounted except for Barksdale. Only brigade commanders were allowed to be mounted that day. The rest of the officers went in on foot. Quote, General Barksdale's appearance riding rapidly along in the rear of the line was a signal to the respective regimental commanders to get alert. Recalled, recall J.S. McNeely. Barksdale then turned to the right, stopped in front of the 13th Mississippi, and shouted, Attention, Mississippians, battalions, forward. And with that, here they come. They start coming across through here. Now, I thought, you know, I've never, I've talked a lot about the Peach Orchard over the years, but I never did a walk on the intricate tactical combat that occurs here. And the truth is, I can't really do it now. But I always thought that basically Barksdale would be coming straight toward us. All right, basically though, in a nutshell, Barksdale is never like you imagine, right? It's, uh, Barksdale is kind of headed at a slant. I'm not saying he's like this or anything at right angles, but he's coming in at a slant. He's attacking like this as he comes through. And his right flank, remember, you're reversed from me, and you're right on target. So you got Confederate and Union side right here. The Mississippi right flank, when they get up here, will be somewhere along this road right here. And his left flank would stretch over behind that red red house over there. 1,400 Mississippians, when they start out, has a line roughly approximately about 400 yards long. And of course, the regiments, you know, would break out. And we'll get to that eventually. But they're basically, within a brigade, he's got four regiments, and they go off within their own. And they start coming across that field. Now, once again, to reiterate what I said earlier, you can look at a thousand maps if you want to, but you'll never get the ground like we have here today. I mean, you just can't replicate that. No other way can you do that except be on this field. And you see those Mississippians, you can imagine, they're coming down that slope right there, and they're starting to... The closer they get, they're coming, and the, and the longer they go across that field, the faster they're getting. I'm not saying they're eventually going to be at a dead run, but, to, but almost instantaneously, your officers are losing control because it's starting. The Union cannons open up, the Confederate cannons fall silent as they pass through, and the, especially the Napoleons down the road over here, 
open up with canister, which in the Napoleon is 28 one and a half inch iron balls backed by two pounds of powder. When that cannon explodes, that can rips apart and those balls go down range and they sound like one Confederate said it was like flushing quail. You know, it had that high pitched noise to it as it was coming down. And uh, they just start blowing holes within those Mississippians. And I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know why, I don't know why one unit fights harder than the other in the Civil War. I don't know what makes that. I don't know how you get that. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, we we'll talk for another time, but um, they get down in that swell and they're taking significant losses. But they come up out of that swell, and as they start to come up out of that swell, they're starting to shoot. I'm not saying it was trained volleys or anything, but a lot of times those soldiers, especially on the seems on the southern side, will be loading and firing as they advance. And they walk right into them, start shooting at them. And so it's pop, 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 pop. You can start to hear kind of like firecrackers or somebody chopping wood over here. That fence down there disappears in the middle of that field down there that runs at right angles to the road. And the Mississippians start coming up with slope. Well, by now, the, the Yankees know that they're not going to be stopped. And so as they come up the slope to behind the Sharpie house, the batteries start to limber up. And they start to get out of here. Or, and guess who's got to buy time for them to get out of here? These poor Union infantry. And so they are going to advance. You can see it. You people on the right have got the best seat right now. If you look behind, over here behind the Sharpie house, all those Union troops that were behind the Sharpie house, the, the Union battery would have been at least one of them. There was two of them up there. Bucklins would have had two cannons on the other side of that barn and four cannons on our side of the barn right there. Uh, eventually, that section that was on the opposite northern side of the barn is going to be transferred to the south down through here. I believe Thompson's battery would be in there too. Um, Graham's brigade is placed on the Emmitsburg Road. This is where we're uh, basically standing here on their left flank, the Union left flank. From right to left, this is past the Sharpie house down there, you have the 105th Pennsylvania, the 57th Pennsylvania, the 114th, and the 68th Pennsylvania, <coughs> all facing west. And the 68th Pennsylvania, can we see it? Their monument should be back, right back behind you somewhere, not too far away. And uh, keep that in mind, because I'll come back to it. The troops facing south are the 2nd New Hampshire, the 3rd Maine, and the 141st uh, Pennsylvania. All right, so here come the Mississippians. As they start to advance, they get closer and closer, and the batteries start to limber up. The 57th Pennsylvania advances over the Emmitsburg Road, followed by the 114th and the 105th. The 114th was originally stationed behind the battery, facing west, but they soon realized that they had to move forward. Why are they moving forward? I always thought because it was, you meet a charge with a charge, which could be part of it. But they got to buy time for this roadbed, this road we're in right now, or adjacent to, for that artillery to get in that road and get out of here. They got to get the horses up. And so the Mississippians wade right into them. Quote, this is a Union quote, the impetus of our advance carried us to the Hemisburg Road in the face of a murderous musketry fire of an advancing enemy. Reaching the road, we clambered over the fence and crossed it. Sharpie's house and outbuildings intervening between us and the approaching enemy. The right of the regiment was advanced to the rear of the house. Over here where we are, Barksdale's 21st Mississippi. Who asked me to talk about that? The 21st Mississippi hits the Peach Orchard where the 68th Pennsylvania is. And the 2nd New Hampshire and the 3rd Maine were in the act of pulling back. If you got an attack coming this way, ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting down the tactical level right now. If you got an attack reaching this way, ladies and gentlemen, guess what? Troops facing this way. So, look, I'm 
trying to make I'm trying to make order out of confusion. You hear me? I'm trying to make order out of confusion. And all this is chaos. This is me just trying to make sense out of chaos. These Union troops, New Hampshire, Maine, the Pennsylvanians over here, are in the act of withdrawing. Now, how good a job they could do under fire, I can't, I do not know. But they pull back. Why are they pulling back? Because they're trying to get their line in order to receive the Mississippi. If they, you know, to receive the attack. And that's when the 21st Mississippi is going to come up and hit them. So you got the Union troops advancing past the Sherpy House. Well, the 21st Mississippi is advances. If you look at the terrain, this is what the battlefield teaches you. They see the Yankees to their left. Not only are, is Graham's brigade down there getting hammered from in front, but now the Mississippians over here start shooting at them. I'm not just talking about from this spot, but down there, they start shooting across the field, oblique fire. They start hitting those Union troops from the side and from the rear, and they're just getting caught up in this crossfire. There's hundreds of Pennsylvanians that surrender around that Sherpy house. <laughs> I want you to know I've had the best time putting this program together. <laughs> I have, and I'm about to enjoy myself quite thoroughly. <laughs> next time, nothing not I like better, you know, shooting some Yankees. What did Memo <laughs> always say what I tell y'all what? What did I tell you about Memo? Y'all be watching those tapes. Folks know this. Mamma, what Mamma say about Dixie? Huh? What is in my day? <laughs> Mamma always said that Dixie made her feel like shooting the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> well, let it go. I couldn't get a bigger tractor than that. <laughs> I go to the house. I saw a guy down when I was in Houston about two weeks ago. I saw a guy down there. He used to, his daddy used to own Ford, uh, excuse me, Dodge dealership. Ford dealership in Houston. I, he walked out. He got into an ordinary truck. And I said, my God, you're not going to drive away in that little thing. <laughs> Good God. He didn't find it funny. I thought it was funny. <laughs> Story of my life. My brother says I should put on going back to the tombstone. My brother says I should put on my tombstone. Quote, I thought it was funny. <laughs> 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 he might just do it. He just, ma'am, he might do it, you know. <laughs> you know, be like my boss. Now, man, holding the letter. Take me through the thought process. <laughs> <laughs> The enemy opened upon us. The concentrated fire of his batteries immediately were in the midst of a terrific shower of shot and shell, and every conceivable kind of missile which made ter which made terrible havoc among us. Okay, <laughs> these Mississippians are rolling into this position, folks. I don't know. You know, my worst. I'm just this is my just my own thing. It has nothing to do with this. But my personal nightmare as far as combat is hand to hand. You know, I see people, I don't want to single out any country, but countries we previously fought over the intervening past sixty years, seventy, eighty years, you know, and I'm thinking, Ooh, I'd hate to tangle with him. And they come up to the dead. I'm a real fella. Probably had to shoot him twice. <laughs> But right out there, in all seriousness, behind that Sherpy farm, there's a lot of things that happen, that, that happen so fast that nobody knows. And I'm not saying anything unethical or illegal happens, because there is nothing unethical in a war. As much as we try to put rules on a war, ladies and gentlemen, it's war, and there are no rules. Okay? That's a shame, you know, but really, you know, that's the way it is. It's war. That's why it's so terrible. And anyway, I imagine, I, I can only imagine. Right All right, if you'll take a look, the Mississippians approach. The Union troops are starting to fall back by now. Graham's brigade is starting to fall back from the Sherpy farm. The 13th Mississippi gets up to that barn. That is not the original barn. It burned during the battle at some point, but not at this point uh, in, the, in the narrative. 
they get up to the barn, and if you look at that barn right there, ladies and gentlemen, if you were a Yankee soldier, what would you do with that barn? You get up in it, and sure enough, they were in there, you know? And um, they're in the barn, and they're still firing. Um, I think where this happens is at that door, where you see the double door down there, I have to assume that the base of the barn is original, the foundation of the barn, even though the rest of it is not. So surely you build, a, with it already having stones laid out, surely you rebuild the same door. That's my theory. I may be wrong. But the Mississippians, the major of the 13th, gets to that barn right there, and the Yankees are still inside there shooting. And he calls his colonel, lieutenant colonel, they aren't paying him any attention, I'm sure they got a lot to worry about. But he calls a bunch of men over there, and they open up the barn door. And I found this very fascinating. He said they opened up the barn door, and the, Yank, the Union soldiers, the Pennsylvanians, have been in there shooting so long that when they opened the door up, the smoke rolled out. And he said he could not distinguish, the smoke was so thick that he could not distinguish friend from foe. And he said in, a, in only a second or two that they had shot, uh, had killed and wounded or captured everybody in that barn. Whatever you want to do, they're game. Right? And some of them would shoot you anyway. I mean, you just don't know how amped you have to get in combat. I cannot reproduce that for you with a thousand words. You do things that, that you know, kind men would ordinarily not do, to say the least. Okay, so what do they do? It's getting, the Union line's starting to fall back. 68th Pennsylvania counterattacks. I wish I had more time to spend about that. This is a great, I'm concentrating on Barksdale. I'm concentrating on Barksdale, so I'm time limited, but the 68th Pennsylvania, what a, what a, if I could give just one shout out to these Pennsylvanians. These boys get pushed back out of this peach orchard right here. They back up on the other side of the hill, basically to where that monument is. That's the left of the regiment. And then they counterattack. They're sent forward again. Right here where you're standing, the only reason I'm covering this right now is your ground zero for this action right here. The 68th is going to advance through the peach orchard. And their advance marker is that white marker back behind y'all, all the way down on the fence line over there. That area. Okay, so they counterattack, but when they come out too far and they push those Confederates back, what ends up happening to them? They start getting hammered from over here, so they advance too far. So, you know, well, it's hard, people. <laughs> and they, what? They're falling back through here. This line is coming unraveled. Marksdale, the Mississippians, as you can imagine, they would have come right through here. They would have been dead, wounded Union soldiers everywhere where you're standing out here today. It's hard for me to just to imagine that. I mean, human beings, people, laid out by the hundreds everywhere where we're going today. We're basically following a trail of bodies this whole tour. You could, you could do the whole progress of this charge by just following the bodies. How cool so Barstale's Mississippians rolled through the peach orchard. But here, let me wrap it all up and we'll get on to the next stop. So that I can hear my boss talking to me, right? Now. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even smoke, but it's still funny. To me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> to wrap it up to my original point. I told you earlier that but what did what did, what was McClaw's order to do back in the early morning or mid morning of July second? He was ordered to attack up the Emmitsburg Road. The South Carolinians, Kershaw, is going to be doing what? Kershaw is trying to do conform to his order. They're trying to wheel, right? Dress to the right, wheel to the left. Dress to the right, wheel to the left. Do I need to say it one more time? Those are the orders. Dress to the right. If you're dressing to the right, which way does that carry you? It carries you toward Little Round Top. If you're wheeling to the left, what are you doing? You are advancing up the in the first road. And so what we're doing, basically following the tour road, 
Does it make sense, people? That's why the toll road's there. Not to follow Barksdale's advance, but to get you to the Union position. And so, therefore, indirectly, you're following Barksdale's advance. We're wheeling from here to here. Those Confederates would have been, the right flank of Barksdale's brigade would have been wheeling right through here to Wentz House. So we're behind you. Right across the street. Over there. All right. How are we doing so far? Good. Good. Doing so far? All right. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to turn around. I don't know where did my lucky, lucky little interns go back here. Oh, you the rear of the line back there? Where did the college kids go? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. If you could, if you could go ahead, tell whoever's back there, tell them we're coming. Well, you know, stop the traffic. We're about to go. Let me get to the to the rear of the crowd so I can get in front. And basically, if you're gonna if you're gonna lose, uh, if you don't know where we're going, we're gonna cross the road and we're gonna take a trail, not the pavement. We're going to take a trail that takes us over to the Excelsior Brigade line. It'll save us a few steps and allow me a minute or two more. And we're going to get on the road and start heading towards uh, following Barksdale's advance. Where you're at, come on down. <laughs> you like that. I know a girl that won't wear, she's got a Confederate flag ring that she'll only wear here in Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. Craziest thing. Mm -hmm. You want a picture, Bob? Come on up. <laughs> Bob and I ride around together from show to show and uh, I don't know why he'd need a picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, is everybody up? I wanted everybody up. I don't really have anything to say. What I want you to do is enjoy yourself when you when, as you're going around because probably if you're like me, unless excuse me, unless somebody galvanized you to get out of your car, you know, you've always got these physical constraints that are going on. Unless somebody galvanized you, you'd never get out of your car and walk this, not on a day like today. So notice it, people. I mean, look, keep, when, when I set, when we set off walking, keep looking to your left as we're walking down through here. We're tracing Graham's Brigade. And as we go down through these, wait for it, undulations. <laughs> That's right. Uh-huh. You didn't think I knew that. Uh-huh. A little few words. That's right. All right, we're fixing to, all right? We're fixing to go down through here in these undulations. There's a nickel word and some redneck jargon in one sense. Um, think about being a Union soldier. Where are you going to be fighting? Where are you going to withdraw from? How are you going to do it? All the way as we're going down through here, whichever side you want to imagine, hopefully you'll imagine both. As you're falling back through here, what are you doing? You would have the Union officers trying their best to keep you together, but on the other hand, think about it. Right here behind you, the 21st Mississippi comes up over the crest, and they're, they're yelling at you. <laughs> Things that your mother did not teach you. <laughs> All right, and here they come. Can you imagine the fear? Put the fear in there. Quit imagining yourself as John Wayne. Put the fear in there. And now you're getting into the shoes of these, both sides. Both sides, that's what they're doing. They're scared, but adrenaline, 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 adrenaline. Okay, let me get to the front of the crowd. <laughs> If y'all missed it, if y'all missed it, there's water trucks right behind you. If y'all need some more water, go get it. No, no, no. We were just talking about it. Well, I hope it's morning. What morning, anybody? Well, I want to thank you, fine folks, for coming out before they get the camera set up. Out here.
Yeah, I don't usually talk about the Mississippians, right? <laughs> no, never. Never. <laughs> You know, oddly enough, as long as I've worked here, I've never done a Barksdale. You'll have to come out sometime when I, you know, I don't mean to, I'm very honored to have however many people I got out here, which is a lot of people. Um, but um, it has its limitations. You'll have to come out here sometime. We'll do Barksdale in a smaller group. We'll all get uh, heat stroke. <laughs> <laughs> then you can all go home happy. <laughs> Or just eat all the candy out of the trail mix or something. <laughs> there you go. There you are right there. <laughs> you like that? A sponge, right? Well, sir, I need to tell you something. Uh, they were on my cemetery tour yesterday. If I remember you, it's usually not good. <laughs> <laughs> you remember us? We were back here in 2012. You took us out on the Cemetery Ridge hike. <laughs> yeah. Mm. What was that word? Surplusage. 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 That's a word I used with, uh, found with Abraham Lincoln yesterday. He taught me that. Surplusage. So I'm going to wear it out now. All right, we ready? We already rolled. <laughs> we, okay, all right, we're fine. Okay, <laughs> welcome to <laughs> showtime here. Are we live? All right, okay. So what do we got? I can't see behind you, but you can back there. Um, what are the union doing? Barksdale burst through the, the peach orchard and the Sherpy farm, or, and there was actually an orchard we don't replant it today, but there's actually an orchard on this side. You basically just walk through it on that. If you took the grass trail, uh, there was an orchard in that area. So we forget about that, but the orchard was twice the size, which it is today. And uh, so the Mississippians are, are on the right. The 21st is sweeping through the Wentz house. They would, of course, be somewhere down here in this general vicinity. The other three regiments, the 18th, 13th, and 17th from left to right, are also sweeping. But what are they doing? They're wheeling to the, to the uh, uh, right, I mean the left, and dressing to the right. And so as they're advancing down through here, what are these Union troops trying to do? Well, they're trying to reform. And going back to the importance of the colors, over there. Going back to the importance of the colors, what happens when the flag is planted? What's supposed to happen when the flag is planted? Yeah, you reform. And so they would take the U.S. flag and they would plant it at different points and they would gather up whatever they could get. Oh, there's the guy right there. And they fall back all the way to roughly approximately right here. So the situation in the Union line is twofold. We've got like a half-opened uh, pocket knife right now, jackknife or whatever. Uh, you've got uh, Carr's Brigade, which stretches all the way down to where you see those big trees, roughly, approximately in that area. You've got Carr's Brigade right here. You've got the remnants of Graham trying to, to fall back, whatever, but they're almost all done. Uh, a lot of them are already headed to the rear, and I don't blame them. And then you've got uh, Brewster's Brigade, which is trying to reform or, or right angles. Now, if you think this could get any harder, you know, the fresh Union troops are facing this way, but they're in defilade. You know, they're not on the, uh, on the Confederate side of the ridge. Why are they not on the Confederate side? Because they can get hit, so they're in defilade. Well, here come the Mississippians from this way. And as I told you earlier, the Confederate line is back behind me. What ended up happening? It, each brigade is supposed to trip off the other one. So when, when the South Carolinians went forward, Barksdale goes forward, however long that took, 30, 45 minutes later, and they advance. And the next line, uh, the, excuse me, the next brigade in line is, is from a different corps and a, obviously then a different division. This is going to be getting into A.P. Hill's territory. And specifically, the brigade that's coming forward is Wilcox's Alabamians. 
So I'm not really going to cover a lot about Wilcox today because, like I said, you know, we've, we've had to cut out a lot of detail for the time constraints. But Wilcox's Alabamians will be advancing on the back side of that hill. You couldn't have seen them. Now, this is perfect. That's what I want to happen because you can't see them. You can't see them right here. And so all this shooting starts. You would have seen smoke going up behind you. But the New Yorkers, primarily, who are trying to reform right here, I'll read you the regiments in just a second. They're trying to reform. They're wondering why they can't get any help over here with Barksdale because these Mississippians are rolling. Barksdale never stops. Never stops. What do you do once you get the enemy on the roll? I don't care which side you're on. What did Nathan Bedford Forrest advocate, you know? Right, you get the skier on them, you keep the skier on them. Once you get them rolling, don't let them get up, you know? If you get in a fight with a bigger dude, don't let him get off the floor, you know? Or if you're going to go fight a bigger dude, don't let him get out of the car. You won't finish that off before he gets out. <laughs> you want to go through the window. <laughs> get that over with. Well, no, no, Matt, Matt is uh, Lothario, he ain't, uh, he ain't no, he's not Muhammad Ali, no, I know. But I will tell you, I will tell you with utmost frankness that you can gain a lot of different knowledge on a lot of different levels from getting your ass kicked. <laughs> now, that ought to be the theme of this tour, actually. <laughs> <laughs> supposed to be family friendly <laughs> out here bleep that out <laughs> there you go thank you. Boss now. <laughs> thank you stuff writer doesn't have that technology <laughs> no, it's, it's raw data um, okay so here they come so let me get um, up to date so what is the defensive line so as I said at least um, Standing right here, you have Graham's Brigade and you have Brewster's Brigade. And that, when I say that, that's the troops facing this way. They attempt to form a new defensive line along the Trossel Lane, roughly in this area. From left to right, remember I'm opposite most of you, all right? Or you're with me, okay? It's all very confusing <laughs> right now. Um, I don't know which way to stand. Um, you have the 70, 70th New York, you have the 73rd New York, you have the 72nd New York, and the 71st. Followed by Burling's Brigade, which is the 5th New Jersey. Right there. At least know somebody from New Jersey. And then Carr's Brigade line, which I have already pointed out. Now you need to remember this. The, 120, well, the 120th New York is in reserve. And I'll come back to them in just a second. I forgot you had that that memory. So how am I doing? <laughs> Barksdale wheeled the 17th, 18th, and 13th and began to rake the Union line off the road. He's on horseback. I've already told you that. But he's behind his men and he's, and he's urging them on. And apparently the only thing he said, this is noted by multiple people, is he keeps saying to them, forward men, forward, forward, forward. He's just, you know, just like you set the dogs loose, you know? And you and, you know, you're chasing those deers out in the woods, you know. Just, you just follow them. Let them hunt out through there. And uh, he's urging his men on. There's a huge clash right here. If I, I'm facing the Union, you're facing the Confederate. So you got Union behind me, you got Confederate in front of me. Uh, the Union line conducts a fighting withdrawal from somewhere they stand. I believe they, if I had to guess correctly, I would if I was them, I would form along this fence line, which is along Trussell Lane, what we call United States Avenue. I would form up there where the Mississippians wade into them. Remember, they've got really diminished numbers. And if you think, I don't have an idea, but let's say if you think all of them rallied, you need to think again. <laughs> they didn't. If I'd have went through that, I'd have probably left too, you know? Um, what did Mike Tyson say? Everybody got a plan until you get punched in the mouth. That's right. Everybody's got a plan until somebody punches you in the mouth. <laughs> and then it goes out the door. All right. So Wilcox joins in. 
and they're hitting A.A. A. Humphrey's line, Andrew, Andrew Atkinson Humphrey, and I need to dispel this so you people don't start sending me pictures of him, all right? He is of no relation over here, A.A. A. Humphrey. But I will say something about him. I don't know. I've never really studied Humphrey. That would be, a, once again, a Carlton Smith thing. He would know a lot about Humphreys. Um, Humphrey's in the thick of this. I don't know a lot about the man, but he's not fleeing, and he's not back in the rear back there in the ridge. He's up here, and he's riding from unit to unit, and his staff is all over the place, and he's exhorting his men. Eventually, you can't do anything else. If you got nothing left to throw in the fight, then you might as well get into it yourself because there's nothing else for you to do. And he's, he's all over the place trying to shore up the line. Now, the interesting thing, at the beginning of the battle, I don't know what the numbers are now because there's been losses, and they don't obviously have a real-time loss counter. But at the beginning of the battle, Humphrey's line here, he's got around 3,500 men in his division. And the Confederates hitting them between Wilcox, Lang, I guess you could throw in... Uh, uh, excuse me, Barksdale, Wilcox, and, and throw in Lang's Floridians, they've got around 3,500 men approximately in there. So you got equal numbers. But the one thing I wanted to point out to you, I don't know how well you can see it with this big a crowd, if the Union line, if Carr's line, brigade line, is fighting on this side of the hill, and the Alabamians are coming over the other side of the hill, and you've got Confederates attacking from this area over here, if they miss, if those shots miss this line, where are they going? They're going to keep going. And so the Union troops, I'm not saying they're hitting a lot of men over there. Most of them probably ricochet along the hill. But you got, we think of everybody up in the line fighting. No, 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 no. You would have a lot of men right here in the rear floating around for whatever reason. And they start striking them. Even though they're equal numbers, Humphrey's position is inferior to the Confederates, and they've got him in a vice. Think of it like a walnut cracker, all right? They got that walnut, and they done got a grip on it, and they're going to they're gonna put maximum pressure on it. And the Confederate line, the, the Confederate attack plan is working. Barksdale's breakthrough is the first significant success the Confederates have had along Sickles line. Now you and I covered several years ago, we went down and covered um, Benning's Brigade. And um, so, you know, if you remember that walk and s some of the other walks, you know, there's a lot of fighting that goes back and forth throughout that area. And I pray that we'll have that reopened soon. I'm looking forward to seeing it myself. Um, that's not true here. There is no seesaw fighting going back and forth, a little bit in the peach orchard, but when the Mississippians sweep through here, it's over. The Union troops are withdrawing. And by this time, in real time action, ladies and gentlemen, think about what is happening on the Union side. Barksdale and Longstreet, the, all the Confederates, they have hit them so hard on the Union left flank that over here, where you see back behind you, my friends over here representing the Union, the Confederates could see uh, if they were here or paying attention, they could slowly watch all these masses of Union troops slowly trickling down and marching at right angles down to the south end of the battlefield. When that happens, ladies and gentlemen, they are cons consistently weakening the Union line across this whole front. Now, I'm going to leave it to, my, to Chris Gwynn this afternoon to wrap that portion of the, of the fighting up during his program. But as far as it applies to us, to back up to the very beginning of this program, where is Dan Sickles supposed to be originally? <laughs> That's right. He's supposed to be, I parked you at the one spot you couldn't see it. Um, so much for planning. Um, the pencil, I swear to God, the Pennsylvania Memorial's over there. <laughs> Behind those trees. <laughs> <laughs> or, as you remember that tour in Vicksburg, right? At Champion Hill. It occurred over there. Yes, sir. Over there in that field of corn. <laughs> right there. And over here, the Confederates charged right over there through that field of corn. <laughs> it's 
So anyway, there's got to be some corn around there somewhere. <laughs> there's a hole in the line. There may be corn, folks, but there's no Union troops. Do you see what I'm trying to plow into your head right now? Do you see the gravity of the situation? I mean, you bought the hat, you bought the t-shirt. <laughs> Can you see the gravity of the situation that's undertaking right now? Sickles is not where he's supposed to be. He's not there. And so what's happening? Now there's a crisis mode. Now maybe if you start tying in the different parts of the battlefield, you can see why Culp's Hill is going to be stripped. Meade finds out this is happening, and oh boy, everything is rushing over here. Anything he can get is rushing over here to this area. And what's happening here? Forward, man. Forward. 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 And these man. Mississippians wade into them again, shooting at them as they advance. Pow, pow, reloading, yelling at them. Enlightened. He's lost control of them by now. The only thing he's doing is urging them on from behind. And they hit this Union line. The uh, primarily New Yorkers are going to start to fall back. The remnants of Graham's Brigade and the other regiments have already noted. And I don't have an exact point, but that line will be uh, falling back or, or advancing if you take the Confederate side right here through where you are. And the Union line, I would think, would make another stand right here along this, this little lip or this ridge. I don't know if it was exactly that point, but they would fall back. Look at the monument. Look at that monument right there. Why do you think that monument's right there? Right? It may, for a long time, I thought, wow, they're supposed to be facing this way. You know? No. Facing this way. Why is that? Because they're getting hit. So that jackknife that I alluded to earlier is what? slowly slowly closing and if the confederates close the jackknife what happens you get everybody and that's not good from a union perspective and these union troops are headed to the rear um, Brewster's front line goes to pieces and the 120th New York who's in reserve moves up to try to stem Barksdale Lieutenant Colonel Cornelius Westbrook uh, com commanding the regiment requests reinforcements, but there are none to send since the whole line is engaged. Humphrey's division is ordered to withdraw to Cemetery Ridge, and this is by Bernie. Remember, Sickles had two division commanders. I didn't cover this, so don't think you're going crazy. He had Car, he had um, Humphrey and Bernie's. And talked about Bernie a lot. That's going to be part of Graham, and that's going to stretch all the way down to Hobart Ward. In fact, one of Hobart Ward's regiments were up in the Peach Ward. Don't ask me to explain. I wasn't going to get y'all lost in all this minutia. But Sickles' Third Corps is spread. The big picture is Sickles' Third Corps line is too thin. And he's had to parcel out his troops to all different places. And, and now that, that all that poor... Uh, planning on his part of that forward movement is coming back and a lot of Union soldiers are getting killed now because of that because of this mistake in my opinion welcome to Gettysburg um, and it's coming over so Bernie by this time if you look right over here now I did set you up perfect for this but I'm not going to talk about it so might as well talk about it now you see that little monument to the left of the barn right over there if you go up to that monument today you will find the oddest things around it I just want you to know only in Gettysburg I was out there scouting it yesterday and I'm just gonna leave it for you okay but you don't touch it though because it's bad luck <laughs> all right but it's unique to say the least you just got to see it I don't know I can't explain it. all right you'll see it. we're going there don't worry uh, that monument I just pointed out is where Dan Sickles gets wounded. And the point, I'm not out here, I know everybody, a lot of people always request me to talk about Uncle Dan, but I, I want to stay away from him today, you know, um, if I could. But Sickles, the big picture is Sickles is wounded. And so Bernie's in command. And Bernie's now in command of what? A dissolving core. 
and it's falling back. And shortly thereafter, I'm getting off in the minutiae. You don't need to know this, but you might care trivial-wise. Hancock is going to take over as these Union lines start to get pushed out of here. And Bernie will be superseded. But anyway, the point is, the order comes to Humphreys from Bernie, who is now in command of the Corps, to get out of here. And Humphreys, I'll give him this, A.A. Humphreys don't want to leave. He's a fighting man, and he don't want to relinquish this position. And always remember, folks, I can't explain it because I've never experienced it, but time after time I note Civil War soldiers saying that we lost more men getting out of there than we did getting in there because you become defenseless as you go across the field. And so as the, as the Union line starts to give way, um, everything goes to pieces because there is no good way to get out of here. How do you get them out of here? There is no good way. There isn't. Um, and so, you know, that that's what ends up happening. Um, he orders the withdrawal. Brewster's brigade leaves first, followed by Carr. So that means these Union troops start to fall back. The 120th New York comes forward, tries to hang on. It looks like the 11th New Jersey. The 11th New Jersey is going to be uh, up there with them, helping them out. And they, they cover the rest of the Union troops as they get out of here. His defense, Humphrey's defense of the Emmitsburg Road is costly. Out of his regiments, he will lose five regimental commanders in the course of this. The 26th Pennsylvania, which was on the end of his line down here, loses 58%. Now imagine a lot of those were captured. Confederates break through the line and they're cut off, probably. And I imagine they gobble them up pretty good, pretty good numbers. While the 8-4 mentioned 120th New York, and the 11th New Jersey, the ones that cover the retreat, and that would be flags falling back across this field. Look at where they're going. Now the Union troops are doing what? They're trying to get out of here and fall back. And that flag is planted, and it was planted again. 120th um, New York and the 11th New Jersey lose 50% covering this withdrawal. Wow. Now, what we're going to do is reorient ourselves. This line is gone. This Union line has gone from this to this, right? To basically, it's gone. It's in the wind. It's in the wind. My pants are dusty. <laughs> what a great idea that turned out to be horrible. <laughs> Matt, what were you thinking then? <laughs> well, it seemed like a good time for Karate Elvis to come out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but your legs bruised up and everything. I know, I didn't expect the other leg to come out from under me. <laughs> it looked good, though. <laughs> Picture it, people. Picture it. Even if you've got a Coca-Cola in your hand right now. <laughs> all right, picture it. Falling back all the way through this field, back toward that ridge, that I would call the lower half of Cemetery Ridge. Hundreds, hundreds of Union troops, shall we say thousands? Now, if you're here, we all know the end of the story. But if you want to understand the story, put yourself in the moment. If you're a Union soldier, you don't even have to be a general. If you're a Hancock, make yourself a general. If you're a Hancock and you're watching this, what are you thinking? Well, Hancock's <laughs> never defeated, but he yep. definitely knows the tense situation. And this is open, people. And if you're a Confederate and you're turning and you're advancing down through here, what are you thinking? A lot of these Confederates are thinking, this is it. This is it. If we can gain, if they can gain up that wood line over there, they split the Union Army in two. That's the objective. We're not going to go far. I'm going to uh, uh, walk through this crowd. Nobody move. I'm going to get on the other side back there with uh, Tom Petty over there. And uh, hey, that's a good compliment. Uh, I like Tom Petty. 
Uh, and we're going to, I'm going to face on that side. I'm going to wait for the camera to move over and we'll move. But I'm going to uh, get you over here in this position and reorient you looking down toward the trossel farm. And we'll start our last descent, okay? This will be a brief stop so y'all don't get too comfortable. But I want you to set you up to enjoy the, the moment right here. Um, all right, let me know when you're ready. <laughs> It's going to be a brief stop to reorient you to where we are. I know the camera, y'all know where you are, but the camera doesn't know where he is. She or he? Um, so, it could be anything. Um, we have now reoriented from basically looking east. Uh, we, have, we have come back a little bit and reoriented ourselves looking down uh, United States Avenue or the We've been called, it probably would have been called nothing in 1863, but in the early history of the battle, it'll be the Trossel Lane. The far, it's a farm lane, okay? And it came off the Emmitsburg Road and it, it went on down through there. And it, uh, you'd never believe this, where it went. The Trossel Farm. <laughs> well, how about that? I once got on the Hanover Road, but it didn't take me to Hanover. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> It was supposed to take me to Hanover. <laughs> and I was just riding out Maryland all of a sudden. <laughs> out of gas. <laughs> so, um, so we're oriented. That's the Trossel Farm, which you see off in the distance right through there. Now, I told you earlier that when Barksdale's brigade breaks through the peach orchard, they wheel to the left and they're advancing down through. It. And um, from left to right, they have the 18th, the 13th, the 17th, and the 21st Mississippi. Somewhere in here, in this general vicinity where we're standing, as the as before, I would take it that the that the entire Barksdale's line closes with those uh, Union troops that I just described. Benjamin G. Humphreys, the Colonel of the 21st Mississippi, is going to look off to his right. And the reason I stopped you here, ladies and gentlemen, is because you could see right back behind the mysterious red shirt man right there. <laughs> right. Um, in that field, which you see out beyond the fence, it's going to be, Humphreys is going to look over there and he is going to see a Union battery retreating by recoil. And what that means is, I don't know if I can give it an adequate explanation, <laughs> is that everybody has seen an RV or a trailer or something being pulled by a truck. Well, that's the way a cannon pulls. You hook it up to the, to the ball and you pull it backwards. And that's how you get a cannon out on the battlefield. Well, if you notice on a, on a cannon carriage, there are two hooks that go down the trail of the gun. Uh, they're called prolong hooks if you want to get deep in the weeds with it. But what we don't have on the cannon carriages today are the ropes. Every cannon would have had a rope. And if you look at the base of the cannon, there's a lunette, a hole at the bottom of it. So if you take the hooks, and each on each end of that rope would have been another a circle or a lunette, they would hook that iron uh, uh, loop around that, that carriage, that prolong hook, and they would run it down through that hole where it's normally attached to the limber. The limber is what pulls the cannon. And they would have strung the, the rope out. Let's say the cannon is supposed well, to orient it correctly. If the cannon is supposed to be firing this way like it was in 63, you would run the rope off the back and you would run you would just let it go uh, limp and you would however long that rope is you would hook it to the uh, limber chest over here so in other words when you hook the gun up or uh, when you have it hooked by that rope you start to pull it with those horses it'll jerk the gun up and it will be carrying it backwards but when the horses stop bam Obviously, gravity takes effect, and the gun just simply because of gravity, the trail of the gun comes automatically to rest on the ground. And therefore, you don't have to rehook the gun up every time and unhook it. When the guns, when the horses stop, the gun stops, and when the gun stops, the gun's ready to fire. Now, what I don't know, and this is not in the manual, is if you could reload the darn thing while it was moving. <laughs> and in a pinch, you know, you might be able to do that, especially with prefixed ammunition. 
because prefix would have your means your powder bag and a wooden sabot are all tied together with a cannonball around about this big, you know. We'll say two and a half pounds of powder. Well, it's not going to roll out. I don't know how you'd exactly shove it in there, you know, with the gun being pulled backward. But then again, I never had a bunch of angry um, South Carolinians and Mississippians trying to kill me either. You know, so I don't know what I would... I have heard the whistle of birdshot, though, in high school. <laughs> Places I shouldn't have been. Now that I got twin girls, I know exactly why he's doing it, too. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> they tell me rock salt. <laughs> if I had more time, I'd tell you a story, but <laughs> I don't. So anyway, what I want you to picture is that, that, look, Humphrey and the 21st Mississippi don't know who it is. They know it's Union Artillery. They don't know who it is. And so they look across there, picture it. They would have seen six guns falling back all the way toward the Trostle Farm. And as they're starting to fall back through here, I'm, I, I actually stopped here in park and let them horses go by. They better start moving because I'm, I'm about out of material here. Picture, <laughs> picture that Union, I'm about to block them in. That Union artillery falling back through there. Well, if you're the 21st Mississippi and you're headed this way, Oh, look there. Oh, wow. No infantry support. Oh. 21st Mississippi breaks off and basically attacks, I don't know, let's make it simple, on the other side of, let's make, put it on either on the trussel lane on the other side, but they start advancing through this field, down through here. And what are they after? They're after those, that Massachusetts battery that's falling back toward that farm right there. What I'm telling you, in the Barksdale hierarchy, the story I'm telling you, there are four regiments, okay? Three of them, including Barksdale himself, are going to continue the attack. And while we're here, we're all oriented, because you're not going to be able to see it that well from where we're going down there. So take a look now. The three regiments right here are going to keep going a little bit further, uh, 18th, 13th, and 17th. And somewhere further down in that field, Barksdale is going to wheel those three regiments and head toward that low underbrush. See where that dead tree is over there? Standing in the middle of that? That's where they're headed. Straight toward here. Meanwhile, that fourth regiment, the 21st Mississippi, is going to be advancing along the Trussell Lane. Out through there. And that's where we're going. What am I doing? All right. Not too bad. We're going. When we get out of here, please watch the carriage as it's coming down through here. Before we leave, is the water truck still here? I can't see. Did it leave? Well, I'm hoping it's down through here. If you could, before you get out in the middle of that road, I have a trail cut on the left side of this fence. If you could go to the left side of the fence, uh, the maintenance workers, which had to go down and beat that underbrush down, would really appreciate it. If you're getting ahead, we will stop at the farm. be a long stop and we're going to start wrapping it up. I hope to be finished within the next. <laughs> and another thing. <laughs> Did I ever tell y'all? Yeah. Right there. Okay. Starting to glisten. As they would say. Look. 
One of these days, maybe the last tour I ever do out here, maybe we'll just do this tour at the bar. Have the camera go around, right? Yeah, <laughs> pass it down, you know. Maybe have those little cameras you can drop in the drink, you know, everything, you know, like on Deadliest Catch, you know. <laughs> Watch the beer go down. You're mine. Oh, no, no, sir. I'm going to the floor, huh? Yeah, that's right, that's right. No, no, no. Oh, man, the Only in the government do you get excited about a 1.2% raise. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, they got us set for 4%. I haven't seen that since, like, 2002. But I wanted to call the White House and tell them, I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, it's 8% inflation now, hang on a minute. <laughs> He doesn't call me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm very blessed to have the job I have. Very blessed. Uh, okay, so we were talking about Bigelow's battery, and they're falling back across this field, and they're retreating by recoil. So you just followed, in a nutshell, the footsteps of the 21st Mississippi coming down through here, this trail which we just plowed. And I don't know how well you can see it. I don't know if John Denver and the rest of the heathen side of the crowd over here we'll just park right here but uh, what you're looking at right here is the trussel farm and what we can't see uh, once again I, you can go take a look at it but when you come down in Gettysburg and you follow United States Avenue and you get opposite the trussel house what is missing today is there was a stone wall behind the house and it went across the road at right angles to the road. The way the road goes this way, the stone wall went this way, and in the middle of that stone wall was a farm gate. I suppose for Trussell Lane. Imagine that. Well, guess what? These batteries get back, the Bigelow's battery backs up, and their, their backs are against the stone wall, so to speak. And Bigelow's ready to get out of there because he can see the Mississippians coming. He's had enough. And about this time, the, uh, the gentleman in charge of the Union Artillery Reserve, a guy by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery, is going to come riding up in this farmyard right here, and he's going to say to them, I want you, let me get you the exact quote here. Uh, he rides up and orders him to hold his position, quote, at all hazards and to sacrifice your battery if need be which for a battery commander is basically an order for suicide. And to compound Bigelow's problem is that the Mississippians, they start firing canister at them, and it's rapid. And the Mississippians can't get at them because of the canister. But what do they do? This little, I know because of the bushes you can't see very well, but if you look right there, and maybe a little bit over here in this gap, you see this slight ridge which you have across the road. The 21st Mississippi starts working the way behind that lip, that little miniature ridge which you have right there. And they start easing up over the end, air, edge of that ridge, and they start plunking at them, plinking at them. And so once they start hitting them with those bullets, if you want to immobilize Civil War artillery, what do you do? You kill all the horses. And I, I'm not saying they're all killed here, but 59 of the battery horses are killed. Now, they didn't kill them outright, but once you wound them, you have to kill them anyway. Especially if you're carrying, the, we overlook this, but you can't have a team of horses with the wounded, with one of them wounded. Because they're, I, I can't explain it, but there's a, some kind of, they know each other. And when one of them's hurt, that's not good. And so, unfortunately, you know, that I don't know whose job that would be, but that happened. Um, the problem for Bigelow's batteries, they got to get the heck out of here in short order. And we're back to that gate and the stone wall. That gate is only wide enough for one gun to get through there at a time. And out of the six guns, I told you this would be a brief spot, out of the six guns, ladies and gentlemen, that were there, uh, the Confederates are going to end up capturing four of them in the farmyard. Two of them will get away. Now they're going to get various limbers and so forth uh, with it. Some of those will get away, but not the majority. Uh, the, uh, the loss of the command was very severe, 11 having been killed of the battery, having been killed or mortally wounded. Uh, if you think about six guns, that would be 11 killed out of um, 48. So you can add up the odds there. 
and uh, including out of the 11, both first lieutenants, which would be in charge of your sections of two guns each, 16 were wounded in addition to that, and two were taken prisoner. Um, so it's not a good day. Humphreys would write, to back up a little bit, quote, he wrote this in the post-war years, when we had advanced one or two hundred yards beyond the peach orchard, I discovered some guns at the foot of the slope to my right, moving this way to my right, exactly like I told you earlier, firing rapidly on, on Kershaw's line. I immediately wheeled the 21st Regiment away from the brigade and to the right. Okay. Um, they subsequently, I might as well go ahead and cover this, because I'm going to go back to the other three regiments over here. But the 21st Mississippi is not done. They keep going. What did I tell you earlier? Keep them going. Once you get the enemy rolling, keep them going. And so they keep advancing. And if you take the tour road, and it curves on around right through here, uh, right behind it. If you keep looking to your left behind the farmhouse, you'll see another artillery battery marker out in the middle of the field. The 21st Mississippi will advance to that monument and capture Watson's battery right there. All right, some people put it a few yards further to the south. But in that general vicinity all along through there, remember a battery would not be like the monuments today, ladies and gentlemen. You would never place cannons that close together like we have them on the field. A battery would probably have a front of, six guns would probably have the front of about 85 yards. On it, if they did it by manual. Now everything varies, but that's pretty much what happens with the 21st Mississippi. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Right through there. Okay, so. What we're going to do is, we're going to pick up and we're going to, if you'll let me in front this time, because this is the portion of the tour where you'll never believe this. I came out here yesterday and I mapped this out, but I still couldn't figure out where I'm going to stop. All right, so this is the point where Matt takes 200 people, 300 people, whatever I got out here, and I take you on a little journey where I look like I know what I'm doing. Okay? So if you'll let me out front, we're, we're not... I've got one better than that when everybody comes up. Boy, they got a lot of people here. We should have just done the whole tour here, then you could have heard. <laughs> so basically, all you got all the tour was like, <laughs> everybody in front of you is laughing, and you're like, I have no idea what this dude just said right there. But, got the hat and t shirt combo. This is your father, Corby Middle. <laughs> oh yes, Father Corby. How about Father Corby? <laughs> no? That's sacrilege. Having me do that. Oh, right off the camera. <laughs> I guess it beats Boehner Wilkerson. Not that flag is missing. I had to put it back. Really? Who stole the message on the sickle, Mark? <laughs> it's that's, there again. That's funny. I don't know if it's funny, but it's unique. There's that. All right, what am I doing? No particular order. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. Now <laughs> oh, we got it. All right. Where's page seven? That would be nice. Anybody remember Paul Harvey? Yeah. <laughs> don't hear that too much.
back there smoking a cigar right now, and I can't tell you how many times he's woke me up over the years in some barn hotel somewhere in Virginia and says, come on, Matt, we got to go do a tour. Oh, that's the last thing I want to do after that night. <laughs> All right, so let me get counted off here. I bet you can hear me now, huh? Okay, Matt's back together. Yay! Right here, all right, where's my camera? Okay. All right, so we are now standing to the north of the Trossel barn. That would be for the camera that is directly behind the camera right now. Uh, so. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I don't know how you couldn't if you've been to Gettysburg before, if you go on the opposite side, there's actually a cannonball hole in the um, barn from a shell which obviously probably came from the peach orchard once the Confederates took over there. The one thing, or, or out of many things, there's many things we do not interpret here, but when the War Department set up this land and the monuments and all this hierarchy, that the original rules had placed the Confederate monuments on their original battle line. So therefore, we do not interpret after the Peach Orchard fell the advance of the Confederate artillery. So if you're ever standing in the Peach Orchard again and you're talking about that, think about that cannonball over here in the barn, they advanced from where we, we began the tour over there at the Confederate lines along Seminary Ridge or Warfield Ridge, and they advanced to the Peach Orchard and they set up all along the Peach Orchard and all along the Emmitsburg Road. And every shot they were firing, down through here, there were hundreds, as I've already noted, Union soldiers trying to escape in the distance. And it's a shooting gallery for them. They would fire, Confederates especially would fire solid shot over, your, over friendly troops because you were afraid the fuses would prematurely burst. So they would ricochet uh, solid shot down through there. <coughs> And, and basically going bowling with human beings. Now, I, I obviously do not have any uh, casualty figures. Now, th talking about artillery, let's think about why did, was McGill, uh, excuse me, Bigelow's battery sacrificed. It was sacrificed to tie in what I told you earlier. There is a huge gap in the Union line basically from a little bit north of the Pennsylvania Monument all the way down to the um, George Weikert House. George or Jacob? George Weikert House. I shouldn't doubt myself. To that area. There are no Union troops. Freeman McGilvery is the reserve artillery chief for the Union is desperately trying to buy time to wheel in artillery batteries to shore up that position and stop the Confederate advance. That is why the Massachusetts battery is sacrificed. Now, couple all that in together and let's return to the other three regiments that Barksdale was still with. The 18th, the 13th, and the 17th. Uh, somewhere in this general vicinity, uh, a little bit to the north, these three Confederate regiments, whatever numbers that they had left after all this assault, all these casualties right here, are going to be advancing uh, through this orchard and down into this swale. Uh, those of you that have been with us a long, long time can remember about 20 years ago that we came in here and we clear cut this swale. And uh, we're, we're running into the same problem again. We can clear cut it, but we can't maintain it. One thing, we can't burn it because it's in marshy ground and we can't mow it because there's nothing but boulders out there and you can't take a bush hog in there. So we're kind of stuck. I mean, how do you keep the growth down if you can't get in there uh, every once in a while? Uh, but anyway, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make with you is, is this view shed would have been open. There would be no trees or very little trees that would have been of this size in 1863. So this, was, this is an impediment. I, I walked this line yesterday up and down the horse trail, which we didn't take today, and uh, I just couldn't get a good view shed for you, so here we are. So a little bit further to the north, the Mississippians are sweeping into this swale. They're out of gas. They stop. 
<laughs> Look over it. Yeah, that probably means it's past one o'clock, doesn't it? <laughs> right there. Okay, probably one on the dot, isn't it? Okay. So, um, last stop. I'm not too far behind. Uh, nobody's impressed by that. <laughs> Are you not entertained? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Okay, so Barksdale hits the ravine. Now this is where you're starting to get lucky. From the Union side. As I told you earlier, Hancock and the Second Corps up further on Cemetery Ridge is drip, drip, drip. is slowly sending regiment, div brigade, division, down to the south. Slowly in increments, his corps is being bled away from him. And now, after he's lost basically half of his corps, he's given charge of the third corps, which is basically a non-existent corps now. And Hancock is furious. But Hancock is a soldier, and a good soldier always obeys orders, or else he's not a soldier. You must have order. And so Hancock dutifully goes down to somewhere around the Pennsylvania Monument, and starts trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, talking about luck, though, one of those Union reinforcements that are marching south would be uh, George Willard's uh, brigade of New Yorkers. And as they're marching south, they're headed for the wheat field. So they're not right here, but they would be back on uh, Hancock Avenue in that area, and they'd be marching down, headed to the south, and then, as luck would have it, they're at the right place at the right time. Instead of going all the way to the wheat field, they end up being right in the middle of that gap in the Union lines. And Hancock orders them, instead of facing or heading to the south, he orders them to face um, to the west. All right? And they turn in this direction, and they start advancing toward the Confederate position. These New Yorkers, I'll, I'll go ahead and finish this. The, one of the regiments is the um, 111th, no certain order, 111th, 125th, 126th, and the 39th. The 39th New York is going to branch off and, and recapture Watson's battery. And eventually, I'm getting ahead of the story here, they're going to, I would credit, with probably liberating Bigelow's guns again. <laughs> But anyway, our focus is going to be on the 125th and the 126th New York. Now, all this is happening on the Union side. On the Confederate side, William Barksdale, as I said earlier, and his three Mississippi uh, regiments are stopped up here. And they're in that swale. And so I found this a very interesting account. Um... Uh, this, this account is from William Youngblood, who was a courier for Longstreet. And I guarantee you that Carlton Smith already has this source. Uh-huh. Longstreet arrived in this world at 546. A.M. or P.M., Carl? <laughs> Okay, so William Youngblood is a courier for Longstreet. He later relates that he was with Longstreet near the Peach Orchard. Longstreet physically is going to advance. I mean, personally, is going to advance with Wofford's Brigade. So what is happening? I told you that the Confederates, or at least the South Carolinians and Mississippians, Hood for that matter too, are wheeling to the left, wheeling to the left, wheeling to the left. Wofford's Brigade is going to go straight. So, to tie it all in, the Mississippians wheel to the left. They push the Yankees back this way. The Alabamians are coming, as I said earlier, from the other direction. When the Alabamians come up to them, if the Mississippians keep going straight, they march in front of the Alabamians. So you would have a T, if you will. That's not what you want in Napoleonic tactics. You want, some, you want them all in one, and an L is what you want. You don't want a T. So what ends up happening, ladies and gentlemen, is that Barksdale conforms to Wilcox. Instead of wheeling to the left anymore, he wheels this way. He conforms with Wilcox, and they go forward. <coughs> All right? And they start advancing. So 
Barksdale's Mississippians. On the other side, you have Wilcox's Alabamians. And on the other side, this is a little bit south of the Kadori farm, uh, would be Lang's Floridians in there, roughly about seven, 800 men. But a little bit outside of our scope of study right here. But you've got three Confederate brigades in this ravine. And it starts right behind the Trussell farm. So William Youngblood is with um, Wofford and, and, and uh, Longstreet. And Longstreet, while he's riding along, William Youngblood comes up to him. And he says to, to, um, to Longstreet, he pointed out to the general that Barksdale had stopped while Wofford's brigade had kept <laughs> advancing. Youngblood rec uh, recollection said, uh, do you want General Barksdale to halt? And Longstreet turned his head and said, No, go tell him to retake his position in line. So what does he want to do? He want, what Longstreet is trying to do is to keep that wave of human beings rolling forward on all fronts. Pressure, pressure, pressure. And so, uh, Youngblood related, I don't know what fence it was, but he said he put spurs to his horse. And as he turned from the peach orchard, he cleared a fence. Uh, racing down here to the uh, Trossel farm. And when he went over the fence, the, the leap of the horse, I, I've never, look, I've been on a horse three times in my life. None of it good right there. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. I see him all the time. One time, you know, you got two straps on the horse. Well, well the horse I was on only had one strap. <laughs> and I, I it started galloping. And I don't know how to gallop. So I just started, I thought you had to be like a jockey. And that, saddle was flopping on the back of that horse. That's the worst whooping I ever got my whole life. I said to myself, if I ever get off this horse, you never get me back on there. I don't know if y'all been paying attention, but ain't nothing much to beat back there. Man. Whew, that hurt. Anyway, he jumps that fence, and when the horse goes over the fence, it throws him. And he catches himself around the neck of the, you ride? He catches himself around the neck of the horse. And he says he barely hangs on to it. But you know, he's got uh, hundreds of people watching him. And when you, you know how it is when people are watching. You know, I didn't hurt, man. I freaking hurt. <laughs> well, nearly you take a few days off. But he says he pulled himself back in the saddle and without missing the get a beat. He rode down here. And somewhere out in this ravine right here, and I couldn't mark the spot. I don't know exactly where it would have been. Uh, but not far from the house in the rear, to the north, he's going to come up on General Barksdale. Youngblood rode to Barksdale and found him behind a quote-unquote a brick milk house. I don't know if that's what they call a brick milk house or where we'd look. I don't know if we're that, that no longer exists. I'd have to that'd be do a little bit of uh, studying right there. Quote, giving him the order from General Longstreet, he put spurs to his horse, dashed a little ways along his line, giving the order to charge at the double quick when I distinctly heard the shot strike him and saw him fall from his horse. Pow! You'd probably seen the dust come off his uniform and spurt of blood uh, come off. Um, and Barksdale goes down. Barksdale had already been struck in the left leg by two missiles. Some people say grape shot, but, but whatever hit him had shattered his leg. If you can imagine being in that much pain and trying to stay in the saddle, Barksdale is still in that saddle with his leg shattered right there. And then that last shot that got him, I don't know how he was turned, but this, <laughs> that's, that means it's been 10 more minutes. Uh, I know these rules. A, a shot hit him in the back and went out through his, uh, what they call, quote unquote, his left breast, somewhere in here. So it came out and exited his body. And Barksdale goes down. Um, unable to advance any further without reinforcements, the Mississippians began to withdraw in the face of those New Yorkers advancing upon them. I read one account where the New Yorkers claimed that they could hear Barksdale before he was shot cursing his men in the swell, exhorting them to get up and attack again. You'd imagine, he's still got fire in him. He's got so much adrenaline going. The center of the line, though, could not be broken. The Confederates, at least with Barksdale, cannot advance past here. 
The Union line had had held by the skin of its teeth. <laughs> you ever walk in there and the piano player quits playing? <laughs> That's when you're in trouble. Prostrated in pain, Barksdale lay on the field until late that night, around midnight, until volunteer stretcher bearers from the 14th Vermont arrived. Finding the general in great pain, Union soldier David Parker placed Barksdale's head in his lap and administered coffee by the spoonful to him. In a letter to the family years after the war, Parker recalled that Barksdale was lucid when he was found. He knew that his death was imminent, but the stout heart was not ready to yield. He wrote this to the family. Now, if you can imagine getting a letter like this. And this is all from David Parker, years after the war. He recorded Barksdale saying, Oh, my wife, it will be hard for her. Tell her that my last words were words of love to her. But my boys, oh, it seems that I cannot leave them. Their loss they will not fully comprehend. They need a father. And many times have I thought and planned for their future. And oh, I love them. So to leave them is the hardest struggle I ever knew. But, to te but tell them that all, that I died like a brave man. That I led my men fearlessly in the fight. I was wounded by a rifle ball in my left limb above the knee, but I led my men fearlessly in the fight. I was wounded by a rifle ball uh, again, but I continued on. Uh, next, I was wounded by having my left foot took off, nearly off, by the arch, uh, near the arch by a cannonball. Though I was weak from loss of blood, still I rode my horse and led my men in the charge. And we broke the enemy's line and drove our enemy. And at the moment of success, I was pierced by a ball through the breast, knocked senseless from my horse and left for dead by my soldiers. And tell them all, all my friends at home. And Parker writes in parentheses the following he repeated several times during the night. He said, Barksdale said, Tell them that I have never regretted the steps. I have, I, I have never regretted the steps I have taken. And although dying, I do not regret my steps now. Although it is hard to leave friends, wife, and children, I do not regret giving my life in a cause that I believe to be right. But one thing I do regret is that I could not have could not have lived to have done more for the cause. Oh, that I might again lead my men, but tell them I die content that my last day's work was well done. I feel now that I am almost gone. May God ever watch over and care for my dear wife, and oh, my boys, may God be a father to them. Tell them to be good and brave, and always defend the right. Barksdale is subsequently taken from this ravine, and he is taken down to the opposite, the present day uh, park maintenance building, big red building. Uh, that would be on Pleasanton Avenue if you want to look it up. And there's an unassuming house right across the street, a little white house called the Hummelball House. And he is taken in there, and he is, he subsequently dies in the farmyard. Um, a Union soldier would pass by there a, a short time after the next day, and he would see General Barksdale laid out dead in the yard, and he would note that his mouth was open and that there were flies coming in and out of Barksdale's mouth. Now, if that doesn't make war real for you, I don't know what's going to do it. And I made the mistake when little old little Benjamin was little Benjamin back there instead of me having to stand up on the toilet, you know. <laughs> Up there, I told him that story at the Hummelball House. I was giving the whole battlefield tour, and that's all he got out of it. Every time we drive down that road, he says, "Daddy, why that man not close his mouth? <laughs> why did he, why was there flies in his mouth? Why?" He just would associate that with it. As I told you at the beginning of the tour, ladies and gentlemen, as I wrap this thing up, 
Barksdale was a Mason. And I can't tell you that this is the reason. I can't tell you that definitively. But what I can tell you happened, and it may be Masonic related, is that somebody, beyond a doubt, took Barksdale's body and buried him next to the, the, the farmyard is enclosed in a fence. They buried him in the farmyard next to the Tawny Town Road. And somebody took great pains to create a wooden headboard for William Barksdale. And I'm not talking about a headboard with just his name on it. It had the date he died. It had he was a former member of the U.S. House of Representatives and listed him as a Confederate general, etc., etc., etc. And then somebody even took the pains to create a crude footstone for him. Now, ironically, the doctor that waits on Barksdale at the Hummelbaugh house is going to take some souvenirs. And some of the souvenirs they took, one of them was one of the bullets he extracted out of Barksdale. And he kept it in true 19th century fashion. The other thing he kept cur cur uh, curiously was Barksdale was wearing three Masonic lapel pins on his shirt, buttons on his shirt, and he kept one of them, one of those Masonic lapel pins. And I am happy to say that the park now has that guy's surgical kit, the bullet, and Barksdale's Masonic pin. It's off that shirt. Isn't that cool? In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, in 1867, in January of 1867, Barksdale's remains will be brought home to Mississippi. And he will be buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Jackson, Mississippi. And his grave will be promptly, unlike Gettysburg, promptly lost. So I can tell you, just like Armistead is in Baltimore, that Barksdale is somewhere within that family plot in Greenwood Cemetery over there. In conclusion, as far as the Mississippians were concerned, I don't have any hard casualties for you. Uh, B.G. Humphreys would later report after the war, at least in a letter, he would say that Barksdale went into a, the attack with 1,420 soldiers, and out of the 1,420 soldiers, he would suffer a loss of 738 in this attack to give you an idea of what they went through in order to do that. That's crazy, the amount of people out there. Now, I got to let you go because I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to get close to two hours on that, and I'm very pleased by this. Um, it's going to be another cannon shot. Another cannon shot. That won't be good either. <laughs> let the cannon shot signal the finale, man. Um, folks, if you're watching on camera, and you haven't been to Gettysburg, get here. Come out here. These people right now are absolutely dying <laughs> for a drink. Okay? And that, which is true. But I'll tell you something, and if you're honest with yourself, in two hours, in two hours you'll forget how hot you were, and the memories will start to soak in about what a, what I hope is a good time you had out here on this battlefield. Okay? Thank you, thank you. My name is Matt Atkinson. I'm from Houston, Mississippi. I live in Cashtown, Pennsylvania. And as Jerry Lee Lewis would say, you can look it up. Another place, another time. Y'all take care. Thank you very much. Yeah.